Hi everyone. Hi Rina. Oh, Rina, official naman your background. background. <laughs> wow. Official your background. Rina, yeah. Save the earth. So are you related? Are you related to Tony? Are you related? Or different uh, branches of Lopez? No, we're related. Uh, yes. So I'm Tony from the I'm from the Marcelo. Yes, Marcelo, Marcelo branch. Tony, you're related to Sitoy? All right. I think so also. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, two o'clock. Two and a half minutes. No, no, he can actually come in already uh, earlier. You can even join us at 2 if you want. Because I think the program is for Ricky. Ricky, the program is Yeah, so Gigi Montinola already gave his inaugural address and, you know. Did you become president after uh, Francis Lim, no? Awesome. Yeah. Gigi. Yeah. Uh, this was my boss in... Francis Lim. Francis Lim, the year's year. Who? Gigi. Lopez. Yeah. You don't know what it means. Hi, Joe. I can hear you, Joe. What are you doing? Can hear you. Joe. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> we can hear you, Tita Marilu. We can hear you. This is Raisa. Hi, Joe. Hey. Raisa, I'm here. We eat having lunch. Yeah, oh, I can hear no. you. I can hear your lunch. Oh. Okay, uh, crazy. I have good pinangat. Uh, Joe, I miss seeing you in the library. No. I and you. Hello, no, D and Eric. <laughs> Can you move the Hi, Chacha. Hi, Raisa. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi, Hi Chacha. Gob. Hi, Gob, Chacha. Hi, Vicky. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi. I'm telling my family to Happy listen to Vicky. <laughs> Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year, Joe. Hi, Joe. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everyone. Happy New Year. <laughs> and your comment box. Uh, good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and guests. Welcome to this joint meeting with our daughter club, the very active Rotary Club of Makati Premier District. It's our second meeting this year. Uh, we had a very engaging speaker, exciting speaker last week with uh, Mayor Abby Binay giving her state of the city address. Today, we'll have the uh, Management Man of the Year for 2020, the Chairman and Chief Executive of uh, Philippi First Philippine Holdings Corporation. And next week, another exciting one with Cherry Atilano, who will talk about Philippine food security. So we will uh, proceed. 
just a few uh, reminders for those who are participating, um, particularly the visiting Rotarians and guests. Um, kindly type on your um, comment box your name, your club number, affiliation, uh, and who invited you to this uh, online uh, meeting. We will uh, please be advised that the microphones of uh, non-program participants will be muted to help keep the background noise to a minimum. May we also request the, um, uh, at, during the open forum after the talk of the speaker, in case you want to ask any questions, please use the raise hand button found on your screen or simply notify us by typing on the comment box and I will try to accommodate and read all of them for our guest speaker. Um, alternatively, you may want to type on your questions um, in the Q&A uh, or you may wish to raise them up yourself uh, by, by raising your hand and I will recognize you. Um, lastly, uh, we'd, request, we'd like to request that you don't leave the, um, uh, the Zoom meeting after the response of the two presidents, as we will be having a group photo up, up with our guest speaker. Okay. Um, Now, may I please call uh, the two presidents, uh, PVP Peter Manzano and PVP Ricky Trinidad to call the meetings to order. Thank you. Good afternoon, fellow Italians, our lovely aunts and guests. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, I now call this joint meeting to order. Good afternoon, everyone. In behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati Premier District, I call this joint meeting to order. Okay, Rotarian uh, D. Helen Donny Chan of, uh, of uh, RC Makati Premier District is, uh, is favoring us with the invocation, but before he, I make him start, uh, I'd just like to ask the Makati Retirants to say a little prayer for Vic Floresco, who's, Floresca, who's currently recovering in Saint Santa, Rosa. Santa Rosa Hospital. Please go ahead, Retirant D. Good afternoon. We start our meeting with a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather this afternoon, Fill this meeting with your presence. Ever grateful for having been chosen by you, we ask that you pour out your love and give life to others through the Rotary Club of Makati and the Rotary Club of Makati Premier District. May we depend on your guidance as we strive to work for the betterment of others with the talents you have gifted us. Help us to serve with enthusiasm and holy humor and a passionate love so that we may inspire feelings of gratitude and hope and life for one another and most especially for the recipients of our club's endeavors. Lord, bless our gathering today with your guidance in the matters at hand. Clearly show us how to conduct this afternoon's work and we include our personal petitions. Amen. That was very nice. Thank you. Uh, now we'll proceed with our uh, national anthem.
As a gentle reminder, I'd like to read the code that we all live by, the four-way test. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to greet our birthday celebrants in the Rotary Club of Makati. Uh, the birthdays are Wilson Tan, January 12th, today. P.P. Felix Amparo, um, January 14th. P.P. Rick Librea, January 17th. And P.P. Fred Perungao, January 24th. As for our Rotary Ants, Ali Basino, January 13, tomorrow, Menchu Tiglao, January 14, Meli Parungao, January 15, and Gina Tan, January 22. As for wedding anniversaries, uh, PP Fred and Meli Parungao uh, just celebrated, oh, will be celebrating in January 16. Uh, PP Roland and Kaling Young, January 16 as well. Uh, Cesar and Baby Cruz, Judge Cesar, January 18. Marcy and Twinkie Marcelo, January 22. And Mike and Connie Toledo on January 22 as well. Anything for the Makati Premier District? I'll proceed. Okay. Um, let me take this opportunity to introduce um our our uh, visiting uh, our visitors for today uh, attendance is 45 uh, uh, Rotarians and 10 ants okay uh, are we sorry chief of staff Rondo I just read the guests for all the attendees all the attendees okay. That's uh, 46 of us. Our guest speaker might walk out on us. Okay. All right. Um, the attend attendees are President Peter Manzano, David Aboitis, P.P. Joe Alejandro, Felix Ang, Arthur Antonino, uh, Attorney Boy Arteche, President elect Louis Asieche, George Barcelon, PDG Peps Benson. Gani Benaflor, Attorney Howie Calieja, P.P. Cesar Campos, Toto Cruz. That's nice to have him. Toto Cruz is with us. P.P. Junjun Dairi, Leo De Leon. That's nice. 
Ezequiel Del Rio, Francisco Dizon, Michael Escaler from London. That's, I don't know what time it is in London. That's 7 a.m. Okay. Dr. Chris, hindi ito. A wrong one. Okay. All right. I've been given a much shorter uh, list. Uh, as uh, uh, Maria Teresa Arambolo, Aida Lina Bautista, D. Chan, our invocator, P.P. Shirley Cruz, P.P. Lilibeth de la Cruz of R.C. Paranaque Metro, Baby Doble, Thomas Drilon, Madeline Joy Estrada, Patricia Manuel Go, Bernie Guinto, Ogo Shun Justin of the PCR of P President elect -elect of R.C. Alabang Madrigal Business Park. Oh, my most beautiful cousin, Corina Kalau. Kat Kim Leander, Rajan Lorca, uh, P.E. Rina Lopez, Evelyn Mate, uh, Maria Victoria Mercado, P.P. Raisa Echenova Pasadas, always close to us from the RC Makati Premier District, Enrique Quiazon, Yave Penaverde, P.P. Julie Rabe of R.C. Las Piñas East, Elizabeth Beth Raboy, uh, Maria Luisa Romero, Ivy Santos, Jocelyn Santa Ana, P.E. Evelyn Servando of R.C. Puerta Princesa Uptown, Marisa Sisip, Sarju, I.P.P. Daryl Timbol of Makati Business District, uh, and uh, Special Vision Presidents, Earl Manio of R.C. Makati, Paseo de Magallanes, um, uh, J.B. Bansil of R.C. Makati, uh, Rosewood, uh, Our Aunts, Nelly Benson, Marilu Alejandro, Our First Lady, First Aunt Pam Manzano, and of course our very beautiful and distinguished district governor, Chacha Komacha. Okay. And after this, I will turn it over to President Peter for the president's time. Thank you, Director Tony. Okay, good afternoon, fellow Rotarians, our lovely aunts and guests. Here's to apprise you of the goings on in our club. Last Friday, we went to Narbacan, Ilocosur to turn over 20 Samsung digital tablets to our brother club, the Rotary Club of Narbacan of District 3790, as part of our club's education under the new normal project. The said digital tablet shall be provided to the different community learning hubs in Narbacan in order to assist students who have not who have, or do not have access to similar technology. While in Ilocosur, we also had the chance to visit San Esteban, the potential site where we can implement our club's environmental project, the Reef Buds Project, which aims to rehabilitate our destroyed reefs and revive our corals. Also last Sunday, our club's Paul Harris Kitchen prepared another 300 food packs, which we distributed to the beneficiaries of the San Juan San Ildeponso Parish and the Saints Peter and Paul Parish, both in Makati City. This is part of our club's Feed the Hungry project, a, bid, a bridge feeding activity where we aim to provide 55,000 hot meals to our hungry brothers and sisters who were directly affected by the pandemic. Of course, in partnership with about 20 parishes in Metro Manila. This Friday, we shall be heading up to Cavite to turn over milk packs by way of food supplements for undernourished children under our club speeding program in partnership with the Kabisig ng Kalahi Foundation. This year, our club has identified 360 children who will be given a supply of milk for six months with the hope that at the end of the feeding program, they, will, they would have gained the right weight for their age and function well as normal children. Finally, on, also on Friday, we shall be making our presentation to the 10 district governors of our voter registration campaign project. Again, this project aims to encourage 10 million young voters who failed to register and vote in the 2019 midterm elections and those 
or eligible to vote in next year's national elections to do so. Well, that's all I have. Uh, back to you, Director Tony. And then we have uh, DBT President uh, Ricky Trinidad, please. Good afternoon, everyone. 2020 was unprecedented, but I'm happy to know that Filipinos have become more conscious of the concept of shared prosperity. In the, in the interest of time, I'll mention only some club milestones. First, 12.5 million, we raised 12.5 million to supply 200,000 PPEs and critical medical supplies to 80 hospitals. 30,000 face masks donated to tricycle drivers, jeepney drivers, and market vendors. An additional 1,000 face shields donated to wet market vendors. We raised 3 million from funds and donations in kind to ser for service projects. We donated $33,000 to the Rotary Foundation we had four global grants approved, two for cancer testing, one for education, one for healthcare. Total amount approximately $300,000. We gave 150 learning tablets to children in need. We also provided 50 hard drives with knowledge channel lessons given to 50 teachers to assist in teaching during distance learning. two mobile clinics for breast and cervical cancer testing to be donated to the Philippine Cancer Society. I can mention many, many more acts of kindness from our members. I have joy in my heart because I have witnessed the generosity of our members. Thank you very much. Back to you, Tony. Sorry. Thank you, President Ricky. Okay, um, I just thought I'd mention, uh, Mr. Press, that if you see on your screen, Vic Floresca has just joined us. Okay, he's looking well. Vic, um, uh, a lot of prayers have gone to you on our Viber post, and we hope you will recover soon. Now, uh, as a disclosure um, uh, requirement of, uh, of our club, uh, I'm related to the introducer and the guest speaker, and... Um, Contrary to what you may uh, a, uh, think, this is not a family affair. It's a Rotary Club affair. So I will uh, uh, ask uh, PE Rina Lopez now to do the introduction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cousin Tony. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Governor Chacha. Um, President Ricky, President Peter, uh, Rotarians, non-Rotarians, uh, yeah, good afternoon. I've been given the pleasure and the honor to introduce our guest speaker today. It is not very common for a sister to introduce her brother as speaker. But I agreed to do so because one, I felt that his message is important and urgent and needs to be heard by Rotarians, especially as our seventh area of focus starting 2021 is supporting the environment. And secondly, because I felt that by doing so, you would know him a little better. And so I will introduce him, not with his many accomplishments, as you can see with the flyer that uh, was sent out, but with a little peek into the man that he is, and his journey into being. Our guest speaker today, although the fourth in our family of eight, was a born leader. It may have something to do with his birth sign, Leo, or his good looks. Hmm. Whatever it was, even if I was a year older than him, chronologically, he always sort of led our adventures. Some of you here were witness to that growing up together with us. Being close in age, we would confide in each other, our joys and fears. I remember that both of us were at some point in our childhood, very scared of ghosts. And then one day he was not. 
And I asked him why, what happened, and how did he get over his fear? He said he questioned his fear and read books on it and understood them and learned not to fear them anymore. That was the kind of person he was and is. Always reading and learning, wanting to know and understand more. We were both varsity athletes in high school. I, a basketball player, and he, a swimmer. Both underdogs because of our height, this did not deter us. We never saw it as a handicap, just a slight glitch. He trained hard and smart and outswam many taller swimmers, winning gold medals upon gold medals for his alma mater, LaSalle Green Hills. He was also always the bravest one among us, doing more than all of us combined, windsurfing, sailing, diving, motorbiking trails, and many more. Growing up, our parents brought us to the great outdoors, going to our farm in Novaliches, now called San Jose del Monte, every weekend, then building a beach house where we would go every weekend, and later, hiking mountains. This love for the outdoors and the water would be the foundation of many adventures, passions, and advocacies in our lives. And was expressed when he established the Oscar M. Lopez Center for Climate Change Adaptation and Disaster Risk Management Foundation, Sikat Solar Challenge Foundation, Benhi, and many other projects on the environment. Oh, and did I mention music? His love for music and um, <clears throat> singing also led him to establish Ang Mission that uplifts the lives of less privileged Filipino youth through music and the formation of the orchestra of the Filipino youth. As he journeyed through life, he took all this and many other experiences and leadership qualities honed them and was rightfully passed the torch by my dad 10 years ago. He has since taken First Philippine Holdings group of companies to greater heights, multiplying its profits many times over and ensuring that business is not just about profits, but about people and the planet as well. We are humbled and yet proud of his recent recognition as a Management Man of the Year 2020 by the Management Association of the Philippines. Exactly 20 years after my father, our father, Oscar Lopez, was awarded the same recognition. The Distinguished Award was bestowed upon him in recognition for passionately pushing for our country's transition to a low carbon economy to proactively address the irreparable damage of climate change for his leadership role in the substantial contributions of the Lopez Group to national development. And lately, especially for our contribution to um, addressing the pandemic and for setting an example for Filipino managers through a track record of integrity, entrepreneurial excellence, professional competence, and great leadership. To help us all reimagine business for the turbulent years and decades ahead, please welcome the Chairman and CEO of the First Philippine Holdings Group of Companies and Lopez Holdings Corporation, my brother, Federico Rufino Lopez. Vicky. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rina, for that uh, introduction. And I was uh, so relieved that it was, it was kind. <laughs> because sisters aren't uh, usually as kind to their uh, younger brothers, but uh, but thank you, Rina, for for, for that, and uh, uh, thank you, my cousin uh, Tony, for for also for that. No, but I'd like also to um, to District uh, Governor Chacha Camacho, um, and then Rotary Club of Makati Premier District President Ricky Trinidad, uh, and the Rotary Club of Makati President uh, Peter Manzano. Thank you very much for for inviting me to, to share my thoughts uh, with you today. And, um, you know, I, I see so many uh, uh, familiar names and faces. I wish this were actually, uh, um, this were actually live 
and that we'd be because there's so many of you that uh, you know I, probably we were together uh, since childhood uh, but i haven't seen you in decades no so i'm, I'm so I'm so glad to be here with you this afternoon no? but um anyway um you know the 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 year we've just been through was really one hell of an opening act to the decade of the 2020s and uh these last uh, 12 months it made what was unthinkable tangible and uh, and real no so we now we now live in a world that's that's not merely complicated but it's tightly interrelated and complex complex is the word we used to wor use the word before com uh, complicated it doesn't doesn't do justice anymore and and complex i think is probably the, a more suitable term no? now to use the words of the mathematician and meteorolo uh, meteorologist uh, edward lorenz no uh, in the 1960s uh, who asks does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? Now, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has driven this into our psyches mercilessly. And it also exposed us to the raw power of exponential progression. And there's a phrase that I really love using these days. It's, it, it's used, it was used by a, um, a Hemingway, um, Hemingway's character, Mike Campbell, in his novel, The Sun Also Rises, when asked how he went bankrupt, and his reply was two ways, gradually, then suddenly. Now, gradually, then suddenly, now applies to so many aspects of our lives. How we go to sleep, how the gradual onset of heart disease can actually lead to a, a heart attack, how technology disrupts, how bankruptcies unfold, how pandemics spread, and pretty soon, how climate change is going to affect us all. Where we're fast approaching the suddenly phase, if we aren't in it already. Now, to effectively navigate this kind of a world in the decades ahead, it's vital for us to, uh, to, to develop senses that spot faint signals to powerful forces about to engulf our lives and our industries. Now, how do we move forward in this unsettling new world? Now, I've felt for some years now that the unprecedented times that we're living in have been begging for a new narrative and a new paradigm for how we live, work, do business, and even how we measure success and progress. Now, today, our way of life has set us on a trajectory of 3 to 4 degrees Celsius of warming by 2100. This current path will clearly be catastrophic and turn Earth into an unlivable and socially disrupted planet way before then, and surely within the lifetimes of our children. Now, whenever I see the uh, UN IPCC timelines no, that are needed to keep global average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, when plotted on a chart, it reveals a curve that's still just within reach, but with each year of inaction, it gets precipitously steeper and tougher to meet. This decade of the 2020s will determine whether we're able to halt the climate crisis in time or watch it run away from us irreversibly. Now, for perspective, even if the world successfully limits warming to 2 degrees Celsius, which 2 degrees was applauded in Paris COP21, if you remember, no? At 2 degrees Celsius war of warming, all the world's coral reefs go extinct. And at 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is the best that we can hope for now, no? only 30% of those reefs survive. Today, we're roughly at about 1, 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming. No? Now, there's another uh, UN report that was released in 2019 and authored by 145 experts from over 50 countries. And it concluded that nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history and ecosystems are collapsing and biodiversity is disappearing and as much as a million species are threatened with extinction and some just within a, a few decades now last year wasn't encouraging in relation to the climate 2020 tied 2016 as the two warmest years 
in recorded history. And we saw record high temperatures in both the Antarctic and the Arctic, which both hold not only huge stores of ice, but also tremendous amounts of methane in their permafrost layers. Now, just for perspective, the Greenland ice sheet in the Arctic has about 7.3 meters worth of sea level rise in them. Antarctica, the world's, which is called the world's ice locker, has about 58 meters worth of potential sea level rise built in them. Um, you know, just, just for perspective, if you have less than a, less than a three meter rise, so it's only a fraction of what's there up there. No? Uh, the city of Manila is underwater. Now, methane, of course, because uh, we're talking about the permafrost layers, no, but methane, as you may know, is about 80, 84 times more potent than than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas uh, over a shorter period, though, over a 20 year period. But if the big melt of permafrost results in these stores of methane being vented into the atmosphere, we would have unleashed a powerful feedback loop that's equivalent to the emissions of another China today. The, the difference will be that no, mat, no amount of climate negotiations can hold that back anymore. Now, if you don't mind a, a sleepless and terrifying night, you, you may want to look up the National Geographic cover story for September 2019, which articulates in full color what's actually happening up there in the Arctic. It's not a very pretty story. Now, uh, the UN IPCC last October 2018 was clamoring for us to cut CO2 emissions in half by 2030 and take it all the way down to net zero by 2050 if we want to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. Now that's, that's roughly a 6 to 7% annual reduction in carbon emissions from now until 2050. Now just for perspective, uh, a lot of the travel and transport reductions and the economic slowdown no, from COVID-19, it actually reduced carbon emissions by 7% uh, uh, last year no, in 2020. So when you, when you look at that, in, in other words, we need a COVID scale crisis every year till 2050 just to keep the planet livable, just to keep the planet livable. Now today at just one, uh, 1, 1 or 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming, we can already see the geologic scale changes happening to our planet's environment everywhere. Now I'm sure you remember the Australian and Californian uh, wildfires. Um, and, and, you know, these, are, these have become almost yearly events already, you know, to the point where I think Australians, when, they, when they were, there was a survey that was taken, um, they actually feared the onset of summer because, uh, because of this. You know? And to, be, to fear the onset of summer when it's something that we always looked forward to before. You know? And, of course, I, I'm sure you remember the drought that reduced the mighty Victoria Falls. This is called the... Uh, the Victoria Falls is called the, the thundering mist because you can see like a mist rising miles and miles away. No? But it reduced that mighty Victoria Falls and the Sambezi River uh, to a mere trickle in 2019. Then, in the short span of a few weeks last October and November, millions, of course you still remember this, uh, millions of Filipinos were sub sequentially pummeled and thrashed by Rolly, the world's most powerful typhoon uh, last uh, this year, uh, yeah, last year, and uh, Ulysses, uh, one that surpassed Typhoon Ondoy's wrath in 2009. The destructive power of these formerly 100-year events has no doubt been intensified by the accelerating climate crisis, and they, not, they now hit us with greater frequency and regularity. The news images that swept our screens barely two months ago painfully called up two thoughts that were always simmering at the top of my mind. The first was that I heard was what I heard Al Gore say in 2016 here in Manila, where he warned that all our infrastructure was built for a world that's now changed. The second was from a was a quote from Thomas Friedman of the New York Times who alerts us that 
with climate change, there would be no such thing as herd immunity. Just a relentless pounding of the herd. Now, how long can, can even the strongest, most resilient communities withstand this relentless and repeated pounding year after year if they can lose everything that they have at least 20 times a year, which is the number of typhoons that we have? And I guess you, you ask that question, oh, is this the kind of world that closes or widens the gaps between rich and poor? And do we just sit around and wait for prayerful resilience of the vulnerable to turn into anger and then solidify into hate? Now, our, our way of life and patterns of production and mass consumption now use up 1.75 Earths annually. That's 75% more than the Earth can replenish each year. Now, U.S. lifestyles account for five Earths yearly, which many others on the planet aspire to attain. All the main life support systems of our planet, from our oceans, our forests, the air, soils, the biodiversity, and freshwater resources, are also all in decline. Plastics can be found everywhere from the bottom of the Marianas Trench to the top of the Himalayas. Our very own Pasig River is the eighth most plastic polluting river in the world. And all other rivers on that top 10 list are thousands of kilometers long. Our Pasig River measures only 27 kilometers. Now, capitalism has brought tremendous and amazing progress, creativity and innovation, no doubt. But as it's currently practiced, it has also left too many behind. And even as we breach much of our planet's safe environmental limits, billions of people still don't have decent access to energy, clean drinking water, toilets, food, healthcare, education, housing, income and work, political voice, social and gender equity, or even peace and justice. Now, our Economics 101 classes taught us this, uh, I don't know if you, if you remember this, the, the rainbow it was a rainbow-shaped uh, uh, curve by Simon Kuznets. No? It was called the Kuznets curve. And this was done in the 1930s. And uh, that curve infers that inequality rises but eventually falls as the economy grows because of trickle-down. Now, there was even an uh, event, uh, environmental version of that curve by economists uh, Grossman and Kruger, uh, done in the later, much later in the 1990s, which promised the same relationship with environmental degradation and that eventually pollution all got cleaned up as countries got richer. Now, theories like these shaped our worldviews and our policies over many decades but we now know that they have scant basis for being true. Economics in my time was taught with the inference that GDP can and should grow forever. In fact, you, you look at it, it, it to every, today. You get into a crisis, you try to grow your way out of it. It's, it's, it's almost like a knee-jerk reaction. And then the environment was belittlingly treated as just as an externality and it, that it had no limits. You could just keep you know, dumping stuff there, you know, in, in, into the atmosphere like it's an open sewer. So we were trained, basically, as economists, uh, we were trained like, like pilots who were taught to fly, but never really how to land. So ironically, despite earning academic honors in my college economics courses at, at, the, at the University of Pennsylvania, I feel now like I have to unlearn and maybe even junk uh, a lot of that knowledge. Now, the populism that's sweeping the world is a symptom of the growing disenchantment with business, politics, and life as usual. In today's world, it's a disenchantment that's moving at a turbocharged warp speed through the power of social media, whether it's weaponized or otherwise. The natural social and political forces being unleashed in the coming decade will likely make it the most challenging and most disruptive that business has ever seen. The COVID-19 pandemic is just a mere fire drill for what's coming. And it demonstrates the scale at which things need to change. So we're living in a time that calls for 
great paradigm shifts. And businesses that seek to thrive in this era must be able to reimagine and redesign themselves for this new world. Now, in this kind of a world, corporate sustainability that seeks to simply tick the box or do less harm is no longer good enough. Sustaining our trajectory today will result in disasters that are not only greater in scale, but also more unjust towards those without the capacity to cope with the devastating changes that are already here and continue to escalate. Businesses need to align themselves, their resources, and their capabilities towards a mission that seeks to elevate everything that they touch, from their customers, employees, suppliers, contractors, the environment, communities, and of course their investors. And CSR or philanthropy may ease our consciences, but the sad fact is they may never scale up enough to heal our hurting world in time. There is an urgency for all of us to go beyond incremental sustainability and transform into regenerative forces that align our profit engines with the need for a better, more just world and a safer planet. <coughs> now, collectively, we have the creativity and innovative energy that's needed to solve the world's greatest problems. And I believe that unlocking this will be the foundation to some of the greatest business opportunities in the coming century. Um, Paul Polman, who's the former chairman of Unilever, and he was the head for the longest time of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. He refers to the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals as simply the world's greatest business plan. Now, why should we care? Um, when the Philippines is just, and I've heard this um, said no, many times, no, that the Philippines is just a tiny fraction, barely 0.4% of global emissions. And so they, you know, we asked the question, shouldn't the large developed nations just be tasked with correcting all this as, as their debt to society? And we, the developing world, should be given the chance to grow as they have in the past. In fact, don't they owe us this debt after using up the planet's carbon limits all these decades and centuries for their own material ends? Now, there's, there's truth to all that. And that's the basis for a lot of, uh, you know, when, when, when people talk about climate justice. But it's also good to keep the issue in the right perspective. The Philippines, despite its tiny contribution to world emissions, is one of the most vulnerable nations on earth to the unfolding climate crisis. I heard Secretary Sunny uh, Dominguez, I think, or, or uh, it, it, at, at MAP and uh, uh, Gigi Montinola just basically saying, Philippines is number three in the world, no? third most vulnerable in the world uh, today to this climate crisis. So we have an inordinate uh, stake in limiting global, global temperature rise to within 1.5 degrees Celsius. Our voice in the community of nations also resonates with a stronger moral power if we're willing to back our words with action, proving that it can be done. However, more importantly, the world is and I use this phrase again, gradually and suddenly waking up to the fact that the very future of humanity on this planet is at stake. It's nothing less. The next 10 years are absolutely critical to whether we get the transition on course for carbon neutrality by 2050 or watch it run away from us irreversibly. The signs and the frequency of these one in a hundred year events are already demonstrating in no uncertain terms that time's up and that we've messed around with the stability of the planets, the planet to geologic scale proportions. And in fact, um, there's this term that just crept up on us, no? but they used to call, I think, that the, the era we were living in, uh, the Holocene. It's no longer that. They call it the Anthropocene because it's so, it's so, it's so um, uh, influenced by what man has done to it. No? Um, now, a lot of this also is this is the incisive and foreboding truth also behind that saying and i'm sure you've heard this we're the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last that can do anything about it now as this reality mainstreams and it's mainstreaming very fast 
the world will also recognize that we have a remaining carbon budget that halts warming to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, that budget sometimes when you, when you, when you, and I, I've seen a, a number of about 500 gigatons or so, or so left no, of that carbon budget. We, the world emits anywhere from 35 to 40 gigatons every year. So think about how many more years we have until we use up that budget. If we go beyond that budget, we should pass already the 1.5. And, and a world beyond 1.5 for me, even at 1.5, it's not livable. You've lost 30% of your coral reefs. What that means for a country like the Philippines that's so dependent on marine resources is, is, is uh, it's catastrophic. So you can see when, when with that limit, and once everybody gets reckons with that number of that 500 gigatons left that we have no, to pollute, the world either fragments and quarrels for their fair share of what's left, which again will be surely catastrophic, or we take the high road as a global community. We prioritize, we constrain what we do, and we make the hard choices of where that remaining emissions budget gets used. Now, um, emissions conscious uh, consumers, and believe me, today's youth, they care so deeply about this. And, and we've been watching surveys. I, I think the McCann Erickson does, does every five years uh, know, a survey of the, um, the world's uh, youth. And you can see how it's changed. No, um, They care so deeply about this environment. And there's probably one of the biggest wealth trans transfers in the world is about to occur from the baby boomers. That's us, maybe a lot of us in this call, the baby boomers to their uh, millennials and beyond no? a type of uh, children. Uh, purchasing power uh, is going to go very, very strongly towards uh, uh, you know, carbon, low carbon type of products. And you can feel it. It's very strong with them. No? Um, now, uh, carbon taxes also is the other thing. No? Uh, carbon taxes and then also detailed accounting of the carbon going into products and services. Also, I'm sure that will, that will become common at some point. The EU is already talking about carbon tariffs that are levied on every product entering their borders. Um, so, Things like that, and they're very possible, especially with uh, technology like blockchain, to be able to, to track and exactly figure out how much carbon there is in every product. Now, as the world comes to grips with this reality, we will see paradigms shifting drastically. And hopefully, we go back to basics. Consumerism also will hopefully be anchored less on our wants and more toward our needs. And hopefully, you know, we focus on prosperity for all. You use the word, uh, Tony, you use the word shared prosperity. No? I think it's, it's such an apt term these days. Um, but it's really, if we can focus on prosperity for all, especially for those left behind, no? rather than on simply aiming to just raise GDP growth per se. Uh, because as we've seen, uh, again, it doesn't trickle down. Then very importantly, we also begin to reimagine and redesign our infrastructure and our way of life for a changed world. And that's, it's decarbonized, resilient, also because of the changes that are already here and that are coming, and also more socially inclusive. Now, just to give you a little bit of a, um, you know, what, what could a, a reimagined and redesigned world look like? Now, we could carve out a definitive path, and this is something that's close to my heart because of the energy. That's, that's the, en the industry that I've been involved with for the last uh, maybe 20, 30 years now. And we could carve out a definitive path to a decarbonized electricity system in the country that charts a transition from, from fossil fuels like coal and natural gas today to renewables like geothermal, solar, and wind. And then st even uh, um, storage batteries and energy efficiency technologies. Natural gas-fired power plants that we have today, which, which again is uh, maybe half of our assets, um, that uh, they actually keep the lights on and complement. They actually complement the renewable energy um, intermittency nicely because of their flexibility and the speed. No? They're actually useful in ushering this age of pure renewables and batteries. And eventually, they could be repowered into using clean hydrogen in the coming decades as as technology on hydrogen develops. No? And then so from methane, you repower all of these power plants using hydrogen 
which again is, uh, is very clean, extremely clean. <clears throat> now, of course, if you, if you green the electricity grid, it opens up the electrification of transport too, which today is practically all from polluting gasoline and diesel. So now, can you imagine once you do that, the improvement in our, not only, the, not only um, in terms of carbon emissions, but the improvement in our urban air quality is going to be tremendous. But again, it's useless if people you know, try to electrify transport today and then uh, the electricity grid is powered by coal. It, it, it doesn't make sense, no? So, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's two steps. You electrify the grid and then later on, you, uh, you electrify transport. No? And that's, that's, that, that's a tremendous benefit to society. Now, beyond the energy sector, we could reimagine also how and where we get our food, our building materials, and even integrating carbon negative materials like bamboo. The design of our buildings, also how we cool them, how we insulate them, uh, even, even things like ideas like district cooling. What, refrigerant, uh, what refrigerants we use is also very important because refrigerants, if it's, uh, and also how we dispose of those refrigerants. Because if it's not done properly, these things have, um, oh, maybe a hundred times more impact than CO2 if those refrigerants, you know, are, are disposed and, uh, and they get up into the, into the air. No? And then also ideas like smart buildings, etc. Now, beyond designing also for a, dis for a decarbonized world, just as important would be planning for resilience amidst what we're already seeing, this harsher climate. And here we could reimagine how we, re how we design our cities with resilient infrastructure like underground power lines and distributed generation, as well as the circularity in the use of water, rainwater, and waste. And waste is a valuable resource, actually, that we're literally just throwing away. And, and again, there's so much of this, uh, I think that globally, I think there's, there's, there's a shortage of phosphorus and that's but it's everything in waste. No? But it's also about building cities that encourage, encourage social integration, community, and compassion. There's an idea now that's coming out called the, so, the so-called 15-minute cities that are being planned for by progressive urban designers and mayors in Paris. Barcelona, London, Detroit, Melbourne, and Portland, Oregon, no? where uh, they call it a 15-minute city because work, shopping, health, and culture are not, not more than a 15-minute walk, bike ride, or mass transit ride away. And here in these cities, they've, they're, they're reclaiming roads from the automobile and, uh, and use them, uh, these reclaimed roads, uh, to create wider sidewalks, play areas, and bikeable, walkable spaces that incorporate nature, public art, and even public performances. They're characterized by having a more thoroughly integrated urban fabric that builds social cohesion among income classes and races. And certain cities like, like Amsterdam are even prioritizing affordable rental housing. And I think as much as I think they're designating 30 to 40 percent of their land area in Amsterdam to affordable rental housing. So that again, um, the, the lower income uh, groups don't have to travel and commute, you know, two hours, three hours uh, to be able to get to their work, which I think is an injustice. And we've seen that basically here uh, with regards to the frontliners that kept our cities working even throughout this pandemic. And so effectively what they're doing is they're, they're integrating um, even the lower income um, groups into the affluent neighborhoods. Now, these ideas, they merely scratch the surface, but, but you know, they're, they're preparing, for, preparing for that world now will ensure that we're equipped to thrive as individuals, as companies, communities, and also as a nation in the coming decade. This was a lot of the thinking that we had also behind firming up our, the Lopez Group's definitive uh, no to coal declaration in 2016. And doing this was not easy to explain to shareholders and analysts who wondered whether it made sense to just shut the door, walk away from a profit opportunity, or compete in the power industry with one hand tied behind your back, especially if you didn't have a coal-fired power plant. Now, despite the doubters, let me say that we never wavered 
and never once regretted that decision, most especially today, where it's becoming harder and harder to get financing and even insurance for coal-fired power plants. And even many of the investors that have come to us at KKR, who's one of the largest um, private equity uh, firms in the world, just invested in our company, First Gen, and they told us, well, they and a lot of the pension funds that invest in their funds are no longer allowed to invest in anyone that's got coal-fired power. And it's happening very fast. Um, now, um, this kind of preemptive action also was also behind our redesign of, we redesigned actually our cooling towers for our geothermal power plants in Leyte um, after they were badly damaged during Yolanda. Now, what we did was we re-engineered and rebuilt uh, them stronger and capable now of withstanding up to 300 kph winds. Before, they were only designed for about 200 or so. And these were done under, um, uh, you know, when, when uh, EDC was owned by, by government. No? But we've re redesigned it now to, be, uh, to, to handle 300 kph winds. Now, we maintain and we've, we've even pre-ordered uh, strategic spares no? with suppliers to, to speed up the return to service in the event of there any natural catastrophes that hit us. No? We also used uh, LiDAR technology to identify and reinforce more than 186 geohazard areas in our various geothermal sites around the country. Now, only time will tell whether we prepared enough. And I hope, you know, <laughs> I hope we have. But we have to admit, of course, that, that um, in, in a general sense, not that business practices and uh, the consumerism that exists today you know, have been at the heart of uh, our lifestyles that use up this 1.75 Earths uh, each year. But this doesn't always have to be the case. And business can either be a destructive force or a powerful one for regenerative change. Now, moving closer to home, last year, we crystallized our mission at the FPH and our group of companies. And uh, in a few short... Apparently high bar, and we're nothing short of humbled by it. Now, let me share a few points about this short phrase. First, the mission was deliberated on and hotly debated internally for months. And finally, it solidified our role in the transition to a decarbonized energy system. But it goes beyond energy and anticipates dealing with the many adaptive challenges needed to redesign how we live, work, and do business in a changed world. Secondly, we didn't feel that it was appropriate anymore to use the word sustainable in a world that's so badly in need of healing and renewal. So we took on the challenge of using the word regenerative instead, with all the responsibility that it carries. Now, we're not a full-on regenerative company today, and no one, no one is yet. But we chose it deliberately to signal to our people that they have a license to adopt this new mindset as our inherent way of doing business, and that it's okay for them to bring their values to work every day. Now, being regenerative doesn't scale if it only comes from the top. It has to permeate the organization and how it does business day to day. And thirdly, the word we used very deliberately was the word collaborative, as we believe we, can't, we cannot do this alone. And we, and, and that includes, and I keep stressing this, our PR and our CSR professionals, they all have to stop seeing this as a competitive beauty contest. And I keep stressing to our people that if we find ourselves ahead and alone at the finish line, we will have failed in our mission. This is a massive undertaking and we know we cannot possibly succeed if we go the journey alone. Now, honestly, these thoughts make me feel small and, and humble because everything that we've been doing so far just feels like a tiny first step on a dangerous thousand mile journey. Now, we're all imperfect beings with imperfect abilities in an imperfect, maybe broken world. But it should never mean losing the courage to make things better. And as the songwriter and poet Leonard Cohen wrote, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering, 
there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Now, in many ways, our journey at FPH over the last decade has been one of sensing faint signals to powerful forces about to engulf our world. It's the only way you can prevent forces that unfold gradually from overwhelming you suddenly. It's preparing for a world that reimagines the role of business beyond the mere pursuit of shareholder value and into one that realigns our profit engines with solving the world's greatest problems. However, let me say that preparing for paradigm shifts of this scale, magnitude, and within such a short time frame can never be easy, especially in the stage before, before any noticeable momentum. But keep in mind the transformation of a common car caterpillar into something so functionally different and radically beautiful as a butterfly. Every caterpillar harbors dormant imaginal cells, each waiting with the potential to transform into something else. And as cells morph, the immune system of the caterpillar attacks them as if they're outsiders or enemies. But as the transformation persists and the number of imaginal cells multiply beyond the critical tip tipping point, the body stops fighting them. It changes over and it begins the process of nourishing those same cells instead. An unformed embryonic wing may start out with just 50 cells, but grow to as much as 50,000 when fully formed. The anguished and labored metamorphosis of a butterfly that can take to the sky in flight, it only begins the moment it's willing to give up being a caterpillar. In closing, never underestimate the exponential power of the interconnected world that we live in today. It brandished its speed and velocity to all of us throughout this pandemic. But this also suggests that a single butterfly flapping its wings in one small corner of the world can unleash tornadoes of regenerative change that reverberate throughout the planet. So make it start with each of us. Thank you. Thank you, um, Iki. That was a very good uh, uh, talk. Um, before I proceed, um, I just want to make uh, a reminder of a statement Iki made, which I've actually written down and wish to say again. We are the first to feel the effects of climate change and the last to do anything about it. I will remember you for this, Vicky, for uh, this will always stick to me. Um, there are quite a number of questions, uh, Vicky, if you're all right mm -hmm. to answer them. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. And I will, uh, I will uh, have the privilege as the moderator to ask the first. OK. Um, the Rotary Club of Makati has, over its 50 years, has actually done most of its services has been for feeding victims, taking care of victims of disasters, feeding the unfortunate sectors of our society, um, and lately uh, providing livelihood uh, to those affected by this uh, pandemic. Yet in one of our board discussions, uh, we, uh, we, we were searching for a major signature project that we can start and continue for the next 20, 30, or the next 50 years. No? It appears that this project will have to come, will have to be uh, on the environment side. And uh, I, I wish to remind President Peter that uh, Piki had given two terms which we can use as a uh, barometer for our project. One is regenerative and the second is uh, collaborative. You know? But Piki, in your, if you think, if, knowing our club that 50 years we've been doing something for society and we're, we're not just fellowship, we're a lot of service. Mm -hmm. What can we, do you, 
is there any project, any anything you can direct us to as to a major signature project? We can start and continue uh, moving forward uh, uh, for years to come. Offhand, mm -hmm. offhand. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Tony, that's a, that's an excellent question. In fact, Harang, you, you know, sometimes when you think about when you think about the um, this whole thing of decarbonizing and and being regenerative, you know, there's so many places to start. In fact, I have a I have an excellent um, it's an excellent resource that's almost become like a bible for for a lot of us. You know? uh, it, it's it's called Project Drawdown by a fellow named. Uh, um, uh, uh, Hocken, uh, Paul Hocken, uh, Project Drawdown, and it, it, it lists down more than a hundred things that, that, you know, in order of priority, the things that can be done to actually to help uh, in this whole, uh, 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 you know, journey towards carbon neutrality. You know? Having said that, though, I think there's a tendency to also feel a little bit overwhelmed with the choice of things we can do, but it's also thinking through the kind of capabilities that you have, no, so that you can you can you can uh, you can create the most impact, uh, and and you know it's, it depends whether you want to because you know on the other hand, um, you know that again a country like the Philippines, our, our vulnerability means already that a big chunk of our uh, population will be affected. Many of them cannot afford. You, you look at what happened under with Ulysses, Ulysses no. Yeah, under Ulysses, you had the, we had the, um, uh, all of those people who basic, many of them have no insurance, no, and basically they lost a lot of the, almost everything that they had. And when you, and we, when that happens, and then twenty times a year, you start again from scratch. So you're thinking through how do you help people like that, and especially when, sometimes you you think is feeding enough. Because then, then it hap it can happen twenty times a year with the twenty typhoons. No, you know I see I see June Palafox is pala with us. No, June has excellent <laughs> has excellent ideas on that, especially you, on what's going on in Metro Manila. No? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Piki. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. One is uh, thank you very much for for uh, and congratulations for the award. And you got it from your father, concerned for the planet Earth and so on. And I think also from your cousin Gina, which I've, I've worked with all of you. And maybe one thing you might want to do, you're a very good exemplar. And I myself had a uh, uh, pledge that by 2030, the buildings we design, communities we, we plan must be carbon neutral. Uh -huh. Because even some of our gated communities, yes, we follow their lifestyle and density. We need nine planet Earth. So our leaders in industry and business should be aware of that. Like if you have a, I'm sorry, I have to share this with my colleagues here because most of us, or all of us live in gated communities. So if you have a large single family home in the middle of the city, you have a higher carbon footprint, environmental footprint. Uh -huh. You're arrogating to your prime urban land resources, uh, 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 depriving like employees of Makati, Ortegas and Fort Benifacio to be within walkable distance to their places of work. Like Makati Central Business District, the, the, the employees of Makati spend six hours a day in traffic. So they're like OFW families. So if we can convince together our own relatives, our friends, that if you have a big house, you go to the suburbs. Like the Trumps, the Kennedys, the Clintons, the rich people in Manhattan, they live in apartments, but their big houses, nasa Cape Cod, nasa uh, away from the city. So we may have to re-educate our, our own policy decision makers. And even our zoning ordinances are so obsolete. Now with this pandemic, there's a, there's a, a great opportunity to correct our mistakes. But the leaders should change their life. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. Thank you, Piki, and I'm glad uh -huh. you can be a champion for the environment. And, and your uh -huh. husband is no longer here, Gina, and your uh -huh. father has retired. And your father has always been a champion for the environment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank no, you, June. June. Would you take yeah. the challenge to be champion? 
<laughs> Talk to your relatives also. <laughs> you know, John, it's a very, it's an interesting, you know, because like you hear all of the flooding that happened. Huh? You know, uh, mm. this is the thing that's going to happen with climate change. The amount of water we're going to get will be tremendous. I mean, it's, yes, it's, it's uh, so like, yet, yet, you know, you, you know, it's funny. You, you look at that. Yet, on the other hand, there are water shortages naman pag summer, no? And you look at what's happening with that water. It floods yeah. our cities, uh, what, many of those that live by the riverbanks, yeah. diba? Yeah. And a lot of that happening also yeah. because of the many of the bowls like like Laguna de Bay or even Pasig the River, a Pasig River, no? Yes. A lot of those bowls yes, are becoming yeah. plates because of the uh, siltation that's happening. They're becoming shallower and shallower. Yeah. So the water has nowhere to go. So all yeah. of that water that should be valuable for us, which is fresh water, just goes out into the sea. It floods. I'm uh, sorry. It floods yeah. everything before it goes, and then yeah. it goes out into the sea where you can't use it. It's it's uh, no. So there are forces the that you can uh, no. There are forces the that you can capture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even the sea levels are rising, and yeah. there's subsidence. I was invited by Manny Pacquiao, chairman of Public Works Committee, the Senate. Yeah. Representing Public Works, poor hard infrastructure. Concreto. I told yeah. them yeah. we need green infrastructure, uh, planting trees in the denuded mountains. Para hindi na bababa yung flood. Puro mm. gray infrastructure, build, build, build. And I told them we should do build better, verde, not build, build, build. Yung mga concreto, dikes and so on. And these yeah. are from Tiffany. Baka sana yung huwag naman balagdagan yung libel cases ko. This comes from pork barrel. They don't call, call it pork barrel, and it's election time. So pork barrels and construction permits are now fundraising for elections. So maybe you have great influence, leaders in the industry. Now maybe maybe as a as a management man of the year, you have credibility because you walk the talk. Thank you. Shut up now. Yes. Thank you, Peggy. We'll, Congratulations. We'll Thank you. proceed with some more of the questions. Thank you. June. Um, Thank you, sir. Thank a, you. There is a question here from President Irwin Bailon of mm -hmm. the Rotary Club of Makati North. The Philippines has been cursed or blessed, depending on one's point of view, with volcanoes and therefore potential sustainable source of power through ge geothermal energy. Should there be a policy and paradigm shift to focus on more of these sustainable sources of energy and what is EDC doing to mm -hmm. possibly spearhead this thrust? Yes, yeah, yeah. That's a, a good question no? because I guess EDC, geothermal for us, uh, that's, been, that's been maybe half our assets no? are, are uh, geothermal. Again, EDC is probably the largest geothermal producer, integrated geothermal producer in the world today. And uh, the Philippines, I guess, the fact that we are <laughs> volcanic, some see that as a disadvantage, but to EDC, it's an advantage. No? Now, um, having said that, uh, geothermal technology that we, that we are using has basically been over, maybe, it's, it's very similar to what it was uh, maybe 30 to 40 years ago, which is the very deep kind. No? It's very deep. You go, you go maybe, uh, and then you find the... Uh, uh, steam fields that are maybe more than 200. You got close to two kilometers deep, and then, and then you you find steam fields that are probably in the 200 uh, plus uh, Celsius range. No, in terms of the uh, temperature, there is there is technology that we're trying to. Uh, and again, we're not quite there yet to be able to use um, temperatures that are lower and fields that are not as deep. And uh, but but you know it's 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 being able to get that uh, get that um, uh, to be a little bit more how would you say um, economic because the drilling part of it is what's expensive drilling geothermal you uh, know um, is a bit like you know, it's not like you can just drill anywhere in the world or anywhere and then and then you'll get a resource there's certain conditions that have to be that have to converge you no. Know? And uh, that's the that's the part that's the most uh, critic uh, that's the most uh, difficult. No? So it's like oil. Sometimes you drill and you may not get it. You may drill several holes, and then you don't have a live uh, field. No? Now, um, 
you know, there are ways to address things like that, but you need maybe the help of, uh, it could be multilateral uh, financing institutions or what, that help you with that risk. No, In other words, that they, they can help you, they, help, they can help finance so that you, even the odds, no? that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, rather than one is to 10, it can make it a little bit more, I uh, know, where you, you, your, your odds of uh, finding a producing field is higher. Things like that could help. No? But again, we're not, we're not really looking for that or asking for it. Uh, but we're basically, uh, because, you know, I guess it's one of those things we're not really looking for subsidies no? and just basically trying to make sure we can. We can uh... But it is, a, it is a resource. If we can, if we can, uh, if we can tap it and even tap this shallow type of geothermal uh, technology uh, moving forward, it's going to be a resource that we can use for even distributed grids no? that are not, not necessarily connected to the main grid. Right now, you have to connect it to the Hanoi because they, can, they, they tend to be in the mountains, so they're far. You, they, they have to connect to the transmission lines. No? But if you can build them uh, almost anywhere in shallow areas, you can, put, you can, you can use it like, like you're doing a genset no? and uh, lighting up a whole community that's not necessarily connected to the grid. Yes, thank you. thank you for that. Yeah. Another question from Erwin Alcomendras. Mm -hmm. They say bamboo is an effective CO2 absorber. What is your take on propagating bamboo here in the Philippines to mitigate problems of climate change? You know, bamboo is an excellent, uh, you know, from a, on a pound for pound basis, it's almost like uh, steel and the carbon, no? Because, because, but it, the thing is, it's it's a matter of using it properly. No, um, it's in terms of strength versus weight. It's very, very efficient. And you think about it. No, as it's growing, it's actually sequestering carbon. Steel, naman, or car, or uh, or uh, you know, these carbon rods. When you're making them, it's uh, emitting so much uh, carbon emissions. No, so that's the nice thing about bamboo. No, yet. I think from a technology standpoint, it's probably not been tapped as, uh, as well. And it can be. I'm not the expert on bamboo. I know there are many good experts here in the country um, that, that, that they're just so passionate about it. There's even a fellow that I've met and talked with who, who, does, uh, who makes bikes, no? mountain bikes out of bamboo. Uh, very, very innovative uh, person. But that's the kind of strength that it brings. And you can use it basically for, for, to build, to build uh, homes. No? Or, or to build the, to build things, no. Um, uh, but, but it's also the, the thing about bamboo is that I think the the standards for it, it's not used because the standards for it, there are no global standards for okay the strength versus the weight, etc. No, uh, things like that have to be worked out. No? Uh, but we have very good, uh, no? I think there's some a lot of bamboo experts in the country, and again it grows very fast. The fastest, uh, the fastest. Uh, uh, Growing bamboo, it's almost like an inch. It's a, it's a grass, an inch in an in an, in an hour. <laughs> so it's it's, uh, okay. it's it's that good, yeah. Good. Um, another question from past president Raisa Hechenova Posadas of the Rotary Club of Makati Premier District. Piki, mm -hmm. our Rotary District is comprised of more than a hundred clubs, based in Makati, Paranaque, Muntinlupa. Las Piñas, Pateros, and the province of Palawan. Mm -hmm. Rotary has added environment as a new area of focus starting July this year. Mm -hmm. In what area of the environment do you think Rotary should focus its projects? Uh, cleaning up our beaches, tree planting, zero waste and recycling, coral reef protection, which would be the most impactful for us to do? Um, you know, Tony, uh, uh, Raisa, I think it's an, it's an excellent question, but the best way to answer that is that we really have to think through your capabilities where you can make the most, the best impact. There are so many places to, uh, um, so many areas to work in. If, if you ask me, no, personally, my own, my own advocacy has really been this whole thing of, you know, a transition towards uh, a decarbonized uh, electricity grid. Uh, of course, you know, this, this, a lot of that will probably need legislation uh, to help it along. No? Um, but the, the reason I feel it's so important is that you can see that the world is going to change. And even uh, if we want to be part of the world's supply chains, I, I, I'll give you an example. No? Uh, 
we have we have um, we have an industrial park that's in um, in Batangas. We have a lot of very good um, locators there. Um, many of them, uh, some of them, actually are part of that supply chain that deal, let's say, with a, a, a company like Apple. And Apple has started going already down. You know, they've already uh, gone zero carbon already on all of their stores. But then they, they, they're going beyond that. They're going now towards their supply chain. And they're, as, they're now still not twisting the arms, but they're requesting the supply chain to already start going zero carbon. And, you know. So you can see the reaction with many of these. Uh, these are, and these are big locators uh, that are located uh, here. They're starting to shift that already. That's happening with, uh, with many, many major multinationals around the world. And as that happens, you can see that this will get there. Uh, you want the Philippines to be part of that supply, major supply chain in the world. And if we're not, and if we haven't decarbonized our grid, uh, we're going to be left behind. Uh, and it, it matters a lot with the youth. And that purchasing power of the youth, it's, it's like a tsunami. It's going to take over a lot of the decisions on, on what they purchase. You can see it, even that the employers that they choose to work with. I was giving a talk at the Asia Business Council in, um, I think it's Vietnam, uh, alongside one of the chairman of one of the largest banks in, um, in in Australia several years ago, and that time they didn't have a you know zero carbon policy yet. No, but he said we're getting there. And I go, what, what's pushing you to go there? He said, you know, every time I interview the best uh, candidates for employment, the young ones, I'm not the one asking the questions. They they're the ones asking me the questions, and they 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 ask me what my uh, what my policy is towards coal fired plants. No. And if I can't answer that with satisfaction, I couldn't. Many of them won't join me. And and it's uh, uh, it, it's it's you can tell that it's 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 a uh, uh, it's like a landslide that's about to hit the you know, And if we're not ready as a country, you know, because if you put in coal-fired power plants, that stays there for 30 to 40 years, no, right? Because that's the life of those plants. Sayang naman eh. And not only that, it's becoming harder and harder to finance. These things will become stranded assets. And if there's anybody here with the banks, I think the banks should probably be more, <laughs> how would you, uh, attuned to that, no? When, when an asset gets stranded, um, uh, again, the, the ability of collecting on those loans becomes tougher. No? And that's exactly what's happening to a lot of coal plants all over, even in Australia. Okay. Um, question again from Irwin Bailon. Mm -hmm. uh, OML Center, I'm not familiar with that was a critical ally of the Office of the President, Presidential Assistance for Rehabilitation and Recovery, OPAR, O-P-A-R-R, in providing science-based information for policy development by government towards economic development that is sustainable. Mm -hmm. Has the Duterte administration taken advantage of available studies and info from the OML uh, Center? Um, we, what should we, yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead yeah, I'll, but, I'll, I'll, there'll be a follow-up question yeah we have some good uh, good scientists that work with the OML center and then what what I was also trying to do was enable them no with um, you know they, they they propose what kind of studies uh, along the lines of the climate change etc no and um, so we we have been working with the climate change commission I was uh, very pleased to hear uh, secretary Sani Dominguez now taking on the climate change commission ahead no and uh, really, because I think uh, I, I sensed also maybe there were some uh, bureaucratic um, issues in the past. Um, so uh, I, I don't. I, I, when I heard this today, it, it, it's almost like how can we help him? No, how can we? How can we help? Now, what's interesting? I thought I I just mentioned this. Um, the OML, OML Center is actually working with the observatory at the Singapore Observatory. We've actually, there's a sea level rise study that's being done, I think, for the whole of Southeast Asia. And we want to be able to be, we're going to be their partner for doing it here in the Philippines. Because I think this is one of the areas that if there's any impact, aside from all the typhoons, the powerful typhoons we're seeing already today, it's sea level, sea level rise. It will impact so many aspects of our our, our cities and, and our people. And everybody... Uh, we're all coastal uh, dwellers, no? a big chunk of Philippine population. So it's, it's going to be um, upon us. No? So I think it's important that we understand the impact of that. No? Uh, and so that study together with the Singapore Observatory 
uh, it will be done I think in about two years but as we as we go along we'll probably progress and all of these studies what we want to do is feed it in also to government so that government is also uh, um, uh, aware no? of, uh, of, of uh, you know and informed by science especially using a lot of the best uh, these are using the best minds in the world as well no? to study these, these problems it will affect us no? okay um, we're were the chief of staff, the secretary, just informed me we're, we're running out of time. But I just thought I'd make two uh, comments. With your permission, Piki, we'd like to, uh, there's a suggestion to disseminate this uh, meeting to other Rotary clubs and perhaps even internationally in the Asian region. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the purpose being mm -hmm. that uh, many of these clubs may find uh, inspiration and opportunities mm -hmm. and use use uh, your advocacy um, as a means to tap the global grant of Rotary Foundation, Rotary International Foundation, and probably implement and execute projects. Now. So I, I just thought I'd uh, mention that in uh, passing. Um, before we end, uh, Piki, may you stay for a few more minutes because we will have a photo op of this uh, meeting. Um, our guest speaker has been frozen. Is it frozen? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we will start with the response from uh, Perfect Vision President uh, Ricky Trinidad. Are you there, Ricky? Yes, yes I am. All right. Yes, I am. Uh, hold on a sec. Can we make sure that our guest speaker is back online? <clears throat> um, President Ricky, I think we should, in since we're responding to the guest speaker, we should at least make him, okay. he was cut off, yeah. He was cut off, uh, Ricky, so let's just, I think he will try to come back in. Okay. Can anyone give Gina? Can you, Rina? Can you give uh, Piki a call to see if he's trying to loop back in? I think his assistant is online, surely. Yeah. Yes, he's trying to uh, come back in. Uh, yeah, we'll wait. We will wait. We will wait. with the uh, premier district. Actually, Ricky, uh, yeah. it's President Peter asked for more time because he's not finished with his response yet. I see him busy uh, typing in his laptop. <laughs> Your, your high energy president, Peter Manzano. Actually, actually, it's Pam who's high energy. Uh, Peter just follows. Uh, uh, It's a good thing uh, 
incoming President Biden will come back to the Paris Agreement for the environment. Maybe we can all chat a bit. Hi, City Carol. Long time no see. Classmate, I, I. Hi. There, we can see you, PCP Carol. Hello, good afternoon. Wala pa ron. Rina. Hi, Rina. Hi, Rina. Yeah. Rick. Where's the new office of first holding since there's the Ben Preston down? Uh, it's uh, Rockwell Business Tower in oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Blue, near, Blue, near Medical Blue City. Day. Near Medical City and Meralco. Ah, okay, okay. I don't know. Yeah. I guess. Shirley, did you get to talk to him? Yes, Ms. Rina, it's uh, his uh, Wi-Fi connection. He can't seem to rejoin it. So he's still trying. Yeah. Sorry okay. about that. Rina? Rick. I didn't know you were older than Tiki. I you were the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Everyone you just, thinks that. You look, you look the youngest. <laughs> so you're, what, mga 41 na, no? Almost. Almost, almost. almost. In July. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if anyone has other questions, um, maybe you can uh, type it in the chat and we can send think, it uh, through Tom Shirley. A Tom Drillon yeah. has a question. I was reading it. About collaboration. Is Tom there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the chat can be saved, the man, and I guess we can yeah. solve the picky also later. Yes, yeah, we can I'm forward here. it. Right. Hey, Tom. Hey. Hi, everybody. Hey, there was a, a question about the OML Center, which, and the chat clarified OML stands for Oscar M. Lopez. Uh, Oscar oh. M. Lopez, yeah. 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 So, so I think uh, 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 what's his name uh, was saying we should all sell our houses in the villages and move to the suburbs. So, Rina, you have to sell your house. Good now. idea. Good idea. Move to the suburbs. <laughs> okay. And then everybody by the beach. A... By the beach. Yeah, and then everybody will live in apartments na lang in <laughs> Okay. Kami green na kami, ha, bro. Green ano, na kami. Green. Anong class in green yan? Green living? Uh, green living, yes. Uh, green environment. Okay. Uh, Tony? Yes, Tony? George. Tony, this is yes, George. George. Yeah. Go ahead. Maybe yes, I right. can add something. Uh, two years ago, I attended a uh, symposium in Japan. Science, technology, uh, series of uh, symposium. And uh, the issue on sustainability was discussed. Of course, that includes uh, pollution, uh, weather change, climate change. And one of the things that came up was really to make uh, the world no? uh, uh, reduce its carbon uh, footprint. There should be some sort of a carbon footprint currency because so that the consumer, when they buy something, they're aware that this is, uh, this is uh, beneficial to the world's climate. 
So that has been talked about, but how to do it, the mechanics of it may be quite complicated. But you're talking about the carbon footprint currency. And then for the individuals, if you accumulate enough of that currency, you can use it for, for things that only people can use with that currency. Otherwise, you cannot. Because if you think the world's population in 30 years, it's going to be almost 10 billion. Mm -hmm. The consumptions of things, you know, all the countries are, if you talk about development, it's about consumption. And when you have that issue on consumption, how do you tackle this problem that we're having? Mm -hmm. So there must be a end-to-end -end when you encourage the consumer mm -hmm. to consume less, buy less, but in return, you get some sort of a carbon footprint currency, which mm -hmm. can be used for specific things only for people who have that currency. So it's just a thought on the long term. Thank I you. don't know how, what's your take on that, Piki. Yeah. No, e excellent idea. I, ca I caught maybe half of it, but when I was listening to George, I think you were, you've obviously been uh, reading a lot on, on these things, no? But it is possible, huh? But yeah. things like that, I think, um, almost like I don't know. I don't know if you call it a carbon tax or whatever, no? But it's similar ideas. Yes. Where, uh, where, and again, with with a lot of the technology that's out there, with, like, blockchain. That, yes. that that kind of a that kind of a, a ledger that, that is very hard to tamper, right? yes. You can do things like that. Eh? Yeah, because it's so, important to get the consumer in the loop. Right, right, exactly. Not just the manufacturers, but get the consumer in the loop. Uh, yeah. When you think about uh, uh, the like what you said, I mean, we're now consuming seven point five of the planet. Yeah. yeah. What more in thirty years? The population is almost ten billion. Yes. No. Exactly. Exactly. That's staggering. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank there you for is, your input, there is a There is a question that just came late, but I think it's so significant. I have to ask it if you're all right with it, Piki. One more, one more last, last question. Mm -hmm. What is your take on reviving the, the Bataan nuclear power plant? You know, my, my, um, my own nuclear power, I mean, as a, as a technology, I'm, I'm sort of neutral on it, but my my take long here for the philippines no especially i mean somebody pointed out rightly so that we are in the pacific ring of fire and the pacific ring of fire 90 percent of the world's earthquakes occur uh in, in this ring no and that's probably why we we have geothermal power no but um when it's like that it's almost like uh it's very very risky and you know the risk with a with a nuclear plant if something like that happens, look at what happened with Fukushima. They haven't even cleaned it up up to now. And uh, they're running out of space on where they put the water, the, the um, uh, you know, the, a lot of the, the uniforms of people that are used, they all have to be buried. And uh, it's Tokyo Electric going bankrupt. And the amount of cleanup that they've spent, I mean, it's rivaling maybe the, the kind of budget that we have, the national budget that we have. So that kind of a risk when something goes wrong, uh, mm -hmm. especially in a country that's, again, in the Pacific Ring of Fire. It's almost like I wouldn't, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I wouldn't be as uh, in favor of it and that uh, we can get our electricity uh, in safer ways, no? Uh, and, and again, in, in, in carbon, lower carbon uh, uh, ways, yes. no? Okay, thank so you. So that's why I know with, with nuclear, no? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, yeah. Vicky. Yeah. Uh, President Ricky, your response, please. Okay, thank you. The adoption of uh, new technological behaviors in response to the pandemic has already reached levels that were not expected for many years. Recent data from McKinsey showed that we have vaulted five years forward in consumer and business adoption. And I hope this will help, like what Piki mentioned er earlier, decarbonize the world. I'd like to commend the Lopez Group and Chairman Tiki in particular for having the foresight to move in the right direction. Allow me to quote from their own literature. Our efforts to tackle climate change have progressed over the years. It started with our call for a low carbon economy in 2009, which progressed to the identification of climate change as one of the company's biggest risks and lead to our subsequent commitment to not invest right. in in 2016. Thank you. Thank you.
for providing our people energy without carbon emission. Congratulations, Chairman Piki Lopez, Management Man of the Year 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you. Yeah. And now, uh, President Peter Mozano, please. Thank you, Director Tony. <coughs> Last November 2020, we had uh, used Bilks and James Gifford speak before us and shared to us how impact and sustainable investing work. We are taught that it is investing with a specific objective of achieving positive social and environmental impact as well as financial return. Today, our able speaker spoke to us and told us that the year we have just been through was just the opening act to the decade of the 2020s, a decade where our way of life will have to change and that we now live in a world that is not just complicated but entirely interrelated. Our speaker has ably cited numerous data on how our lives will undergo drastic changes in terms of not just investing opportunities, but more importantly, on how we deal with our environment. We have to be more responsible in utilizing Mother Earth's natural resources. Indeed, our human population is both growing and aging, and we consume natural resources faster than we can replenish, and the emissions that are mainly responsible for climate change just keep on increasing. And people are beginning to realize this. People are investing on environment. In fact, year 2020 was a big year for environmental, social, and governance, or ESG investing. And it is expected that this year will be a bigger year for ESG as more and more people realize that climate change is real. We're going to see a lot more of the investors shifting capital towards less carbon intensive assets. Now more than ever is the best time to adjust our plans for the future, taking into account how our environment is added to the mix. Yes, the main threats to economic recovery are very much still in play. The resurgence of coronavirus infections and its knock-on effects like the decrease on customer demand, the supply chain disruptions, and the low workforce morale, to name a few. Yet, most of these threats are intertwined with how we have been treating our environment especially moving forward. We need to carefully plan for our future, taking into account our responsibility to the environment, not just in terms of refocusing our investment priorities, but also in our way of life. In the words of Dr. Cindy McGovern, the CEO of Orange Leaf Consulting, we need to plan for what is, plan for what if, plan for what's next, and plan for what's new. Our esteemed speaker started his presentation by quoting Edward Lawrence, who asked, does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? Then he closed by urging us to never underestimate the exponential power of the interconnected world we live in today. Let me also end my response by citing French biologist Louis Pasteur's advice, fortune favors the prepared mind. Knowing is one thing, but being prepared for the inevitable is another. Thank you, Mr. Federico Lopez, for sharing with us your time and expertise. Thank you for sharing to us your valuable insights on reimagining business for the turbulent 2020s and beyond. And on behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, our lovely aunts, our district, Governor Chacha Camacho, the other Rotarians from the different Rotary Clubs in the district, especially my classmates, Perfect Vision Presidents, our Rotaractors and all the other guests in attendance, please accept our heartfelt gratitude for taking time in being with us today. Once again, thank you. And of course, as tokens of our appreciation for your time and service, we shall be giving you a copy of our 50th anniversary coffee table book, which contains our club's 50 years of community service and fellowship together with a bottle of red wine for you to enjoy while going through the pages of our book. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Thank you. We will have the we'll have the uh, picture picture up uh, followed by the uh, adjournment. So if everybody could please turn on your video so that um, you can be included in the photo. Okay, one, two. Wow.
Kan last. One, two. Okay. Uh, President Ricky. <laughs> Yes. Yes. In behalf, Ricky, are you? Yeah, yes. Go ahead. Okay. In behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati Premier District, I close this meeting. Thank you. President you. Peter. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, this joint meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Piki. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thanks, Pix. Thank, thank you, Piki. Enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky. Bye. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Rita. Thanks, Thank you, Tony. Peter. Congratulations. Thank you. Hi, George. Hi, Ricky. What's that? George. Good speech. Thanks, Good George. Speech, Ricky. Good speech. George. Thank yeah. you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Ricky. Bye.